All right. So uh, welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us today. So a little bit about myself. My name is Amira. I am one of the BioProtocol ambassadors. And for those of you who may not know, uh, BioProtocol was launched about 12 years ago by a group of postdocs to make detailed experimental uh, protocols freely available for everyone to read. Uh, I will be dropping later the BioProtocol's website in the chat uh, where you can explore a little bit. Uh, as BioProtocol is all about science reproducibility, uh, today we introduce you to some approaches that can be used to process complex image datasets. As you know, advanced microscopy uh, methods in general often produce huge datasets that need to be objectively translated into reproducible knowledge. And today our speakers will uh, discuss this topic. Uh, after each talk, uh, please be sure that you, you will have time for your questions. So after each talk, we will have um, a few minutes for a couple of questions. And then at the end, we will dedicate around 30 minutes for discussion. Uh, so on to our uh, first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Kugler. She is an award-winning scientist at the interface of biology, advanced microscopy, image analysis, and science art. As a research fellow at University College London, she developed Gliamorph, which is a 3D glia analysis tool for confocal and airy scan uh, imaging data. During her PhD at the University of Sheffield, she developed ZVQ, which is an image analysis pipeline for zebrafish brain vasculature in light sheet microscopy data. Last year, she founded her own company, Zeeks Art for Geeks, which provides data analysis and science art services. Today, Dr. Kugla will discuss the establishment of image analysis approaches to visualize, quantify, and understand as well uh, biological processes as ImageJ is one of the most widely used open source analysis tools, it will be referred to among other approaches. Uh, so on to you, uh, Dr. Kugla, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Let me just share the screen again. Just a second. All right, can you see that all right? Perfect, thank you so much. So hello everyone, also from my side, it's um, great to be here today and discuss with you a little bit about biomedical research. Um, so we know that biomedical image analysis is a really key pillar in life sciences, especially as we live in this era of technology and a lot of our data is really based on images. And in today's talk, I thought I want to discuss with you three questions. They may, might sound really basic, but I thought it's really important to take a step back and then maybe discuss, you know, in this round table, what they really mean. So firstly, I want to talk with you about what is biomedical image analysis. And we know it is about quantifying images. That's, you know, clear so far. But really, what are the data that we're talking about? And what is really the role of a biomedical image analyst, especially kind of nowadays how it is changing um, with remote positions. The other question is, why do we need cross-disciplinarity? Because I think the huge benefit of biomedical image analysis is not the individual techniques from individual fields, but really when they come together and work together to really break barriers and, and found new kind of strategies. And lastly, obviously, Fiji and ImageJ is one of the most widely used image analysis tools around there. And so we can't talk about biomedical image analysis without talking about Fiji and why Fiji is still a really great tool to use. So without further ado, I want to talk with you about the first question. Like I said, it is about quantifying information and extracting meaningful insights from medical and biological images. But I think the more we think about biomedical image analysis, the more we see it's not just about preclinical model and fluorescence microscopy data, but that is much, much more data to it. For example, this is just one example where we look at the cytoskeleton of a cell culture. But if we step away, for example, looking at zoology, we know that biomedical image analysis is really important for phenotypic studies. In this example, we look at bee health and how this has a role in crop harvest and economics. We can talk about modeling and simulations, and especially with the pandemic, we have learned that structural analysis is hugely important to understand host pathogen interactions, and therefore also, you know, understand disease spreading. We use biomedical image analysis nowadays, especially a lot with deep learning and AI, and I won't be talking about that, but I think we all know it is really important to extract new features and also have predictions done with it. 
And lastly, I think biomedical image analysis is also very, very important, obviously, in the medical field for computer aided diagnoses and surgeries. And this is just one example of an X-ray, but that is one of the techniques, obviously, with CT, MRI, etc., where biomedical image analysis is really important. I personally work mainly on the first kind of data set, which is preclinical model, especially zebrafish and fluorescence microscopy. But even within this really tiny kind of field or, you know, what we kind of think of tiny, there is a huge variety of different tasks, and different levels that we do as biomedical image analysts. Mm -hmm. And I won't go through all of them, but I think the important thing is that, you know, it is such a huge field that you kind of need to find your own niche and then get specialized in that. So, for example, myself, I think I'm really good in data understanding and more like on the data acquisition side of things, as well as segmentation. And for example, Jonas is awesome at like quantification and kind of multimodal data integration. We obviously use different kind of approaches for all of this, but all of this falls into this field of biomedical image analysis. And I think also, especially in the last few years, what has also become really important is obviously that there are more and more new environments, especially Python and Ampari have become huge in biomedical image analysis. So I think this is also really important to think about that kind of the whole establishment of new um, software environments is really important if we work with multidimensional data. So choose the right environment for your data, so to speak. But I personally kind of always say in my job description, what do I do? I say I translate images into knowledge. So I typically get 3D plus fluorescence microscopy data and I develop a workflow and then transfer back some data, such as the number of cells or the volume or the intensity to the researchers. And so this sounds really simple, but it is a huge problem. And this is also why this roundtable is great to have like this open discussion because we know that it is a huge challenge how to really transform all these data into number. And this is what we also see, for example, in this questionnaire where we ask people, if you work with microscopy data, what is the biggest challenge? And over 50% of them said it is actually data analysis. And I think this really just emphasizes how important it is to have you know, a cross-disciplinary approach to work on this um, biomedical image analysis to translate images into knowledge. And so that's why this next part of the talk is like, why do we need cross-disciplinarity? Cross um, and I think this is really important because we think of an experiment often in a kind of one directional way, right? We think, okay, we do the experiment, we have an idea and a hypothesis, then we set up the experiment, we might do a drug treatment or we add or, or, or take something away. Then we sit on a microscope or another machine to actually acquire the data. Then we give these data, for example, to a biomedical image analyst, and they then give us the data back and let the scientists interpret them. But I think the more you work in biomedical image analysis, the more you know that this is not true. It is really that all of these different components really have to interact with each other and they influence each other. And the more we talk with each other, for example, a biologist and a microscopist and a data analyst, the better our outcomes will be. And so I will give you three examples of this cross-disciplinarity. And obviously there are many, many more to this, but you know, time limitations are just three examples. And I hope they will really emphasize what I mean with we need cross-disciplinarity to get the best data analysis possible. So in the first example, we very much focus on biology of things. And this is an example where we very closely worked with people in the lab who were trying to stain and visualize a certain cell type. In this example, we look at so-called glia cells. So these are cells of the eye where we have a top part and a bottom part. These are the cell bodies. And here they would have lateral protrusions where they interact with other cells. As a standard, what is used is a transgenic line. So it has a DNA construct, so to speak, in its DNA. And the cells are visualized with a cytosolic fluorophore. So the fluorophore is inside the cells. And we discussed with them how we best could visualize these very fine protrusions. And we came up with the idea to actually target this fluorescent protein instead of into the cytosol to the membrane. And this is what you see here. So this is more or less the same construct and it's the same cells. So these are just DNA injections. That's why it's single cells. But what you start to see is now that we can visualize suddenly much, much more detail, such as, for example, on the top, you see that there's like a honeycomb structure. We see that these cells go really from the top to the bottom. They have a very nice cell body and also these lateral protrusions. And so this is just the overlap to show you these are really the same cells, right? And you can already visually just assess that there's a huge difference in this image quality. But this directly translates what we can do in the image analysis, because now that data quality is so much better, 
we can start to segment and quantify these data with much, much more accuracy than we were able to do so before. So this is now the step called segmentation, where we extract the images from the data. And when you just compare these, again, these are the same cells. Here, if you were to quantify the number of these lateral protrusions, obviously wouldn't work. Here on the left, you're able to do so. And this is one example of this back and forth conversation between biologists and data scientists. I want to give you a second example, which goes more onto kind of the actual microscopy when you sit on the microscope. And again, this might sound really super simple, but I get a lot of data which have one of these things wrong. And if I can't see it in the data, then we can't quantify it. So I often kind of say to people, just give me one or two images before you acquire a whole data set. And then we discuss what we can do and how we can improve it. And then you can acquire a whole data set. And so the typical three problems that I see are those three, sampling frequency, signal decay, and calibration issues. So in terms of sampling frequency, when you look at your tissue in the microscope, so this is just the X and Y axis, obviously the tissue is three-dimensional. And when you go into the tissue, you can set the sampling frequency in the Z axis. And this is just one example where we have on the left, the, uh, the intervals set to one micrometer. On the right, it's set to 0.19. So it's about a factor of five difference, but it's the same tissue. And if you just compare those two images, when we look at the side of the stacks to the individual slices, what you start to see is that here we can pick up so much more signal than we were able to pick up here on the left. And this is just because we changed the sampling frequency, right? Which is more accurate for these really fine structures. And so this is just like one example where we say, OK, now we start to see these structures, we can actually quantify them. But if we can't see them, we can't quantify them. Again, very it sounds really simple, but sampling frequency is probably the most common issue that I get with data from, from other people. The second problem is signal decay. And this is especially the case for confocal images where we have a focused laser light hitting the tissue. So again, this is the X and Y axis. And now here we look at the Z axis, so the side of the stack, so to speak. So here would be the top of the tissue and here's the bottom of the tissue. And what you see here quantitatively is that when we look at the X and Y plane, so single plane, the signal distribution is very equal and very homogeneous, which is what we would expect. But as soon as you go into the tissue, what you already see and what we can quantify is that as soon as the laser hits the tissue, a few microns in, there's a huge decay of the signal. And this is obviously because the laser interacts with tissue, which is a normal thing. But a lot of the time when people kind of assume we quantify the same thing here as well as here, we need to caution them and think about, you know, is it really the same thing that we will quantify on the surface as well as kind of the depth of the tissue? There are, things, are ways to address this, but um, a lot of the time, kind of, you know, there's still some differences that we do see. And the last example is for calibration issues, which is from light sheet microscopy, but it's the same for, you know, every kind of fine microscopy setup. And in this case, we talk about the calibration of the light sheet with respect to the optical axis. And we look at the brain vessels of a fish. So this is a maximum intensity projection. And you would assume that if this is the left brain hemisphere and the right, that you have the same kind of data on, this, on the left as on the right. But what you see is that, for example, these structures, you can't see on the left. And this is because the, the light sheet wasn't accurately aligned. And so if someone asks me to quantify the same thing as they would want to quantify on the other side, I would say, OK, I can't because obviously I can't see it. And this is just, again, like an example of you need to get the data quality right. But the kind of also kind of question after data analysis is what we do with data interpretation. And this is, again, a lot about like back and forth conversations with what do we expect from our data? And I just want to highlight kind of this analysis doesn't mean anything without validation. And so we have a lot of conversations with the scientists when we, once we have the data to say, what does this actually mean? And does it biologically make sense? Right. And so I'll just show you one example again, um, where we look at the segmentation of the brain vasculature. So again, it's a maximum intensity projection of 3D data. And what we want to know here is how good or accurate each of these segmentations is. So can we quantify the brain volume or vascular volume with either of those? Those two techniques are only different in the way how we pre-processed the data. So on the left, we have what we call general filters so that are unspecific to the vessels. And on the right, we have vessel-specific filters. So they are meant to improve really the vasculature. <clears throat> 
And so what we wanted to know is if we quantify the vascular volume in those, can we quantify or like, you know, can we get a sense of like how accurate each of these methods is? And so to test this, what we did is to acquire a data set where we had a control. So it's nothing happening to this fish. Then we take it out. We open the heart cavity and let the blood leak out. This means that the blood vessels collapse and therefore we assume there's a reduced vascular volume. It's called exsanguination. And so in theory, you would assume that if you quantify the brain vascular volume, that this one has less than the other one, right? And so we first tested the vascular volume for this first segmentation approach. And what we see here is that there's a slight tendency. So you could say, okay, there's a trend maybe to reducing the vascular volume um, in these exsanguinated samples. But actually, it's not significant. And more importantly, what you see is actually that, for example, this sample has a third of the vascular volume than this one up here. And this is biologically not very likely, right? If you have age-matched controls, you would assume that they are more or less in the same ballpark and not three times the, the volume than, for example, the sibling. And this is actually confirmed when we look at the second approach of segmentation, which is having this vessel-specific um, processing. Well, we now are able to see that there is a significant difference um, after this treatment of exsanguination, but also the variation reduces right down. So now it's about 15%. And this is what we biologically expect, right? And this is so important because now we can go back to the scientists and say, okay, this is what we biologically wouldn't expect, right? We have fine-tuned it now, does that make sense? Or would we need any further fine-tuning? But things like that, you only find out when you really talk a lot with the biologists and the people who sit on the microscope and um, kind of find out what is the actual kind of, you know, um, factor that you would expect kind of statistically to be happening. And so these are just some examples of, you know, why I think the conversation shouldn't be just one directional, but really in all the directions and talking with different people involved in the experiment. And so in the last few minutes, I promised to talk a little bit about Fiji and Image J. Um, and I think it is really important to highlight that obviously it is still one of the most widely used image analysis software tools out there. But it is also kind of being, you know, a little bit overtaken by Python or Napari. But still, I think it is so important to mention it because it is very, very easy to install, use and extend, especially for beginners in image analysis. And so I just wanted to highlight a few points why this is the case. Because firstly, it has a graphic user interface, right? So you can just click some buttons, which is obvious. But also the nice thing is it's very interactive. You can visually assess your data. And when we work with visual data, I think it's important to have this visual feedback of what is happening and, and you know, while you're actually doing it. The other thing is that it is Java based, meaning you can run it across platforms, but also you can integrate other languages with it. And the community is making really huge efforts on, on combining different languages that it's not just based on Java. And lastly, and I think probably the most important thing is that it is purpose built for image analysis. So Python, for example, is general purpose built. So you could do mass spec or like anything basically, but ImageJ or Fiji is just built for image analysis. And this means it can handle this huge variety of different data that we work with. And these are, again, just several fish data, but I've been speaking about, you know, pathology, x-ray, bees, et cetera, all of them you can work with in Image Day. Mm -hmm. But also the size of data that we work with is so very different. So for example, we can work with Brightfield, Aeriscan, and Lightsheet, which are different from megabyte up to terabytes of data. And I think especially towards kind of the Lightsheet side of things, Fiji is great because it was purpose-built. And that means that you can handle these 3D plus data very easily. So I think it is still in the field, probably the most commonly used one for 3D plus data, especially for stitching of multi-position imaging, because it was very, very um, much designed to handle light sheet data. And also, for example, for uh, registration and motion correction, if these are the things that you want to do, Fiji is still probably the most accurate or like not accurate but probably the most evolved tool to do this um, especially with um, all the other tools together I personally kind of understand the strife for many people now saying oh I absolutely need to learn Python and I need to move away from Fiji but I always say if it does what it needs to do you don't need to necessarily learn another language and I think especially for beginners in image analysis the fact that you can record macros, which increases the reproducibility and, you know, automation, et cetera, it is really a great tool. So I would definitely, if someone is a beginner, absolutely recommend that they should use Fiji rather than diving straight into um, coding languages.
But also, obviously, today is all about kind of open science and sharing resources. And so I thought I'd just bring up this slide that um, I think is really useful. So these are just different tools for biomedical image analysis. So some of them are more beginners, some of them are more advanced. But I think this really highlights um, that there's a lot of kind of resources that are free to use. And the community is very helpful and supportive. And I think, you know, you can email anyone in the field and everyone will reply and help you with your questions that you have. And I think that makes this field so very special. And so um, kind of just to wrap up, I have kind of discussed three very broad topics, um, but I want to open up this discussion to talk about, you know, really what is the role of a biomedical image analyst and what we do in the different fields and why I think Fiji is so important. And so with that, I just want to thank a lot of people, especially the University of Sheffield and UCL, whose data I've been showing and all the other people involved and um, everyone for attending the talk. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so, so much, Elizabeth, for this interesting talk. And uh, now we can take a couple of questions um, for the audience. Please feel free to unmute yourself and say your question. If you don't prefer to, you can also type it in the chat. Hi, Elizabeth. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you for going through that. And many, many questions that sort of branched off from that as, as you were going along. Uh, the first thing that sort of hit my mind is, I think it was the uh, second or third slide where you talked about um, data understanding. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by that, because I think a lot of people, you know, we have all that interpretation, we know what we're looking at, but what sort of specifically are, are you uh, referring to that? Yeah, I think that's a great question, um, especially because at the moment, a lot of people are discussing, you know, how we can, you know, broaden data understanding a little bit more because I'm by training a biologist and I then kind of came into microscopy because I just loved the data and then I kind of slipped into biomedical image analysis so it was all a little bit by accident right but I think that helped me to understand that you know for example things like how do you stain your cell how do you set your sampling frequency how do you how do you even store your tissues overnight or how do you set it to incubate things like that all have an influence on your data, right? And I think the more you work with different data, you start to see different problems. For example, in antibody staining, you always have these speckles, right? And the more you work with people, the more you see, okay, this is a problem. Why is this a problem? How can we overcome this, right? And so I always sit down with researchers and say, can you explain to me what you're doing? Like, what's this sample? What is the staining? You know, really understand where they're coming from to understand what I need to do to, you know, help them make the data better or actually analyze the data, especially things like, for example, antibody staining or, you know, background on, you know, the typical things that when you sit on the microscope and you're like, oh my God, um, what do I do? That's the things that I like really like to kind of encompass in this data understanding discussion. Well, yeah, I, and I think that's a very comprehensive answer. I think what a lot of it stems back to then, or it sounds like what you're going towards then and what your talk covered a lot of was it's all about having that communication uh, and that back and forth between the different scientists um because typically when i'm thinking about or what i typically tend to do as well as a biomedical scientist is when i'm doing the experiment then i'm out in the lab i then sit in a little dark room do the um image acquisition and then i'm probably in another little dark room trying to figure out how to do it all in fiji but if you're going back and forward like that, that sounds like a way of sort of progressing forward. Um, and it almost sounds then like what we could be moving towards is when you have like, for example, RNA sequencing data sets, you typically hire a bioinformatician to come in and analyze those for you. But now possibly it's a good idea to start bringing in bioinformaticians to start analyzing your images as well and help make those um, that data a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. And that's also like, I think one of the things why I moved away from academia to industry where I can, where I can actually literally do that, because when you're in the lab, you're meant to be good at everything, right, from your sample fixation to the staining to being on the microscope to analyzing the data to presenting them, you're kind of, you know, a yeah like doing everything and so I thought you know I I would like to focus on one thing that I'm really good at and you know do that rather than having to do everything but yes I think that is a thing I think more and more we should think about outsourcing at least some aspects of it um but also starting to think about you know offering more training on 
you know, especially very basic image analysis, because I think everyone is interested mm. to understand their data more. But there isn't really a lot of courses out there where, you know, people are really trained on this is how you look at your data. This is this is what your first step should be. You know, like it sounds really basic, but this is what we work with every day. Um, so I think, you know, things like that would be really important. I think just to, to jump in there, like I, I think this raises sort of a very interesting question that, that I'm sort of wondering about a lot, which is just that of the specialist versus the generalist, right? Because on the one hand, you're raising here this point about how useful it is when 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 you can talk to 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 each other, even on if you're on different ends or at different points in the sort of typical analysis pipeline or, or imaging and analysis pipeline. But of course, the best way of, of doing that is if you're just one person, because you're constantly talking to yourself um, and you, you, you know everything from the beginning to the end, right? Yet on the other hand, if you're just one person, it can be exceedingly hard to reach the level of specialized skill that you would need to really develop some sophisticated analysis. So I, I don't know, I, I don't really have super good answers to this problem, but but let's just kind of what, how you think about this, because you're kind of a special case, right? You have the background as a biologist, but you're increasingly specializing on, on, on the analysis side. So you kind of get a little bit of both basically, but if you're coming from a software engineering background, it's gonna be very hard to build that connection to the biology. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think, I mean, it's the same for you. You're like more like biology and then kind of into image analysis, right? So we're both um, with a very similar background in that. But um, yeah, so, so always talking to myself wouldn't be a good thing. I just wanted to mention that. Um, so yeah, I think it's always good to get other people's input, but also um, I think there's more and more exchange between, especially also different image analysts who are, for example, software engineers, and they go into labs and have a look and speak to people and say, like, what does a mouse look like? You know, understanding this kind of, you know, what are they looking like to understand what the data they're getting? And the other way around, I think there should be kind of a, a, a yeah, general understanding, but I wouldn't expect you know, every PhD student to know how to do a 3D segmentation, things like that, right? And I think nowadays that is probably where the field is pushing a lot, that people are like, you need to analyze your own data, when actually the acquisition itself is is already like a huge block of time, right? And so, yeah, I think it is a really good discussion, this general versus specialist, and it's probably needing a mix of them. Hmm. Uh, I also have another question, actually, that just came to my mind now, uh, especially for those who are still new to Fiji in general. Um, so, for example, if they would like to execute a very simple task, such as uh, determining the co-localization of two stainings or whatever. Um, usually, if they just Google something like that, they would find so many different plugins and approaches and how would uh, a newbie in the image data world decide which which tool they, they would go for? Like on which basis, what factors should they consider in general to make it a bit simpler for them? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, so I think so. The first thing is to mention that there's a lot of videos and like the free resources that I just shared. Like for example, on YouTube, there's tons of like very basic intro macro recordings but also the um, image j website is great with a lot of like papers linked and tutorials and things like that so that's definitely somewhere to go also there's a forum called image.sc and i can write that in a chat in a second which is really useful so if you're unsure what you're doing you can always ask a question there and that is the great thing about the community but i think the thing is that no task is simple and especially for example co-localization is actually hugely complex right it is really one of the most difficult tasks actually to do accurately and so I would always say if you don't know where to start reach out to one person in the field like you know someone who knows for example co-localization so on the forum you can ask those questions and people will respond and say oh have you looked at such and such or have you thought about this and this and so people are really helpful but there is no kind of, you know, there's no cookbook, so to speak, but obviously there's lots of resources and I'm happy to share those slides again as well um, with this list of resources. And if someone uh, already have such resources, 
but at the same time, they cannot decide which tool they should be going for. Like for colocalization, for example, you would have multiple approaches you can use in order to sometimes reach a different result. That's also a problem. How yeah. you analyze the data can really affect the interpretation at the end. So Yes, that is such a good point. Um, I think, again, talking to the specialist is always a good option, but also like comparing different tools, like you just mentioned, is a big thing. So the segmentation comparison that I showed was also a thing where we literally just took two workflows and looked at which makes more sense for our data, right? It could be different if you look at, for example, Ariscan versus lychee data, but it could also be different if you have a very specialized staining. So I think a lot of it is also just testing and seeing what works or like, you know, what gives you the best results and then taking that as an initial step and, you know, kind of moving on from there. But I think also image analysis is a lot about repetition and kind of trying things and then saying this works this doesn't work and then you know going on to the next one so I think I hope Jonas agrees but at least for me a lot of the time I just sit there and I'm like nope no, nope. <laughs> like that I don't know if it's so for you uh, yeah I mean I, I I guess what I would add to that is is that the difficult problem is when multiple things seem to work right but you're not but they're giving maybe slightly different results or or, or something like that and I would always say like uh, obviously, get, getting in touch with experts and stuff is a good idea, but but also just doing science, right? Meaning, okay, you have these two results, you don't know which one is right, so you come up with an experiment that could be on the computational side. So certain tests that you do, you scramble your images uh, to to check uh, how how the algorithm behaves on that, or it could be an actual experiment like in the lab, the, the way that, that, that you know, Elizabeth has shown with, with exsanguination and stuff like that. So you do an extra experiment to actually validate your, your algorithm's results um, for, for whatever option you've chosen. And obviously this adds work, right? Which is, which is like, yeah, but, but, but yeah, that, that there's often, I think that as someone who is not like, if you're not deeply in the subject and you can somehow from first principles sort of figure out why one approach might be flawed and another might not be, which is very, very hard, I think, um, the, the most secure thing to do is always is to do science, do an extra experiment to distinguish your, uh, like the, to validate your, your algorithm. Uh, thank you so much, Jonas, for, for your input. I think this might be a big of a, a huge discussion that maybe we can go to uh, at the end of our webinar for more details. And uh, for now, I would uh, I would like to uh, move on to our next speaker, Dr. Jonas Hartmann. After completing his training as a restaurant chef, he decided to change careers and ended up studying biology in Switzerland and also doing a PhD on collective cell behavior at the European Molecular Biology Lab in Germany. Uh, currently, he is a postdoc at University College London, where he uses quantitative microscopy to study the interplay between cell fate and cell mechanics. Uh, during embryonic development, cells and tissues are known to display very complex and coordinated behaviors. However, dissecting their inner workings in advanced microscopy datasets uh, remains very, very challenging. Uh, using examples from his own work in cellular morphometrics, uh, Dr. Hartman will introduce some key concepts and approaches towards a quantitative understanding of complex multicellular systems. And now the floor is yours. Right, thank you very much, Amira, and thanks for the invite. So here we go. Um, let me hide this and there we are. Okay. Can you see my screen? Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, what, I, what I do, I guess, in general is this sort of uh, mixture of, of developmental biology and, and integrative image and data analysis. So I, I just, yeah, I, I'm going to use that as a sort of springboard to talk about a few things that I think are, are are sort of very interesting in the context of of this conversation. Also, following on from from what Elizabeth has already told us, so the kinds of questions I ask are I ask in in my science uh, are about the interplay of transcriptional signaling and morphomechanical states of cells. So mechanosensing and sort of how information flows both ways through this, 
Um, and then they're in particular also at this interface where we go from single cell behavior to collective cell behavior and, and have to ask this question of how cells act within context uh, as compared to how they act sort of as individuals. And then, I mean, collective cell behaviors to show you some examples of systems I've worked on. Uh, this is the zebrafish posterior lateral line primordium. So this is a group of cells that really move together. And while they're moving, they're organizing into these packets of cells that they then deposit and that go on to, to develop uh, specialized organs. So you have a lot of really collective mechanical motion uh, while simultaneously also having patterning going on and so forth. Another example that I'm working on these days is the neural crest. Neural crest cells migrate during embryology throughout essentially the entire embryo and sort of deliver cells to different organs as sort of just-in-time delivery systems for system for different cell types. So in this video, you can kind of appreciate the, them sort of emigrating from from the dorsal side this whole thing is a zebrafish embryo and um and, and you can see that again there's a lot of complexity here of some cells moving more densely together some cells moving as a loose swarm so there's a lot going on and finally when i say collective behavior i also kind of mean um collective patterning and, and cells sort of talking to each other so this is actually a drosophila uh, embryo where um in the in the bottom left here you can see spots representing uh, expression of a, of a target gene. And essentially, these cells are talking to each other through notch receptor in order to establish, uh, after some development, to establish a single row of, of cells expressing this target gene, uh, the presumptive mesectoderm. So I'm going to sort of touch on all of these different examples to basically talk about what we want to do in terms of image analysis when we are trying to understand these hugely complex multifaceted developmental systems and the cells that are working together in them. So basically to, to sort of boil it down, a couple of things that we would want to do, a couple of main goals would be to quantify image data to derive useful measurements, which we've already sort of talked about a bit, then to integrate multiple different types of data because these systems are so complex, and finally to interpret the resulting complex data sets to gain new biological insights. So I'm just going to touch on each of these aspects uh, briefly to, to, to highlight a couple of things. So um, Elizabeth has already kind of talked about the quantification side of things. I just want to highlight this distinction between what we might call more unstructured data and more structured data um, very sort of in unstructured data like images, you have these diverse types of information from the distribution of cells, let's say, to the shape of cells, uh, the intensity of different signals. Uh, all of this stuff is somewhere in there, but it's not particularly accessible from a computational perspective. It's all sort of encoded in a, in a distributed form within your image, within your 3D stack. Um, let's say, and and on the other hand of the sort of extreme, you have structured data where you have uh, really this nice sort of table, you have some features that you care about, some some measurements, and then you have your samples, for instance, your cells uh, in your rows. So this is also called tidy data. And then, of course, you have a spectrum in between of things like network representations, which are somewhere in between uh, in between these things. But in general, in, in the quantify, on the quantify side of things, what we want to do is we want to move from more unstructured data to more structured data, extracting the information that we really care about in the process. So the kinds of pipelines that uh, what, what a kind of pipeline might look like is you start with the microscopy, obviously, you then let's say you care about cells. So you segment the objects you care about, you segment your cells, then you would have some way of extracting specific numerical features from those from those uh, segmented cells uh, to integrate those across multiple, uh, multiple experiments, multiple different types of, of data, and finally to, to explore these results. I'm not going to talk about what I call context mapping here, but um, if you want to read up on, on this particular pipeline and what sort of has come out of it, um, that has been published some time ago. Um, so just very briefly, I'm not going to go into the details here. Um, Elizabeth has already highlighted that there's great tutorials online. Uh, mine, uh, which is this one, is a little bit older by now, but still a good introduction. So the idea is that if we have some uh, some sort of nice, uh, let's say, 3D data set, we want to look at the individual cells, right? So we want to somehow tell the computer where the individual cells are so that we can then take them apart and, and analyze them individually. And of course, there's been a big transition here from sort of classical algorithms, watersheds, that kind of stuff to more uh, machine learning, deep learning powered things. Uh, again, like I think most of that is, is best sort of looked at uh, by, by going to these online resources that are that are really, really good. So I'm not going to talk about that. 
uh, too much. But um, once you have your single cell segmentation, you're not really done with going from uh, unstructured data to structured data because even the individual images of cells don't yet really contain the kind of information that you can directly biologically interpret. So you want to go, for instance, from something like this to something like a morphospace, space, let's say that represents cell shapes. Now there's two sort of general ways of doing that. Um, and the, the sort of, I think, most common way uh, for good reason is, is we might call feature engineering. So here you design a handcrafted set of measurements that directly measure things that you care about, volume, eccentricity, uh, you know, intensity of a marker, that kind of stuff. So, so these are very specific and that they're very interpretable. And Elizabeth has talked about this a little bit already. Um, but then there's the other side that if you just want to, if you want to understand these complex systems and you know that there's a lot of information in there that you, that might not be immediately obvious to you because it is hidden in unstructured data, we might, we might want to do something we might call feature embedding, which is to extract latent features. So to automatically try and recast the interesting, the important information of say cell shape into a, into a numerical form that, that we can analyze more easily. And there's a, a lot of tools for, for doing that nowadays. Um, one I've developed based on geometric morphometrics. I think that's probably no longer the state of the art nowadays, um, but it's out there. Um, so, so where you essentially use sort of a landmark based approach to try and, and quantify cells based on how different they are from each other or from a reference cell. Um, the sort of state of the art things that are coming up now are things like deep learning, where you can use autoencoders to get a latent space uh, that represents a, a, a complex, complex shape. And then we have also some interesting methods coming along, for instance, from Virginie Ullmann at, at MVBI, um, where um, they're using parametric fitting. So they're using types of mathematical functions that can represent things like cell shapes even really complex cell shapes, and they fit these functions and the parameters of the fitted function then can essentially serve as your, as your shape features. Um, so these are, these are some of the ways nowadays in which you might go from a, a sort of unstructured representation of cells to, to these structured, uh, structured representations. So just to briefly summarize the, the quantify part, uh, so yeah, we want to go from unstructured to structured data in general. Uh, we might do things like single cell segmentation or in general segmenting foreground objects, and then we need to either engineer or embed uh, features out of that. Um, so yeah, so then on to, on to integration. So microscopy really, I think, to understand complex systems, we need data integration because a single experiment is always going to be limited in the number of things that you can highlight at the same time, right? You have, a, you have maybe four or five separable channels. Um, so you're going to have to do multiple experiments. Usually you can't even use all of them, right? Usually it's good if you can use, if you have two well-separated channels with, with good markers. Like in this case here, uh, it, with these transgenic markers in the lateral line, uh, you know, I, that there's always one channel is blocked for, for the membrane signal. And then I have one other channel that captures information about different cellular structures or then for something like hybridization chain reaction stainings in neural crest cells. Um, if you want to stain for different genes, you can you can do that up to a point uh, simultaneously, but you're very quickly going to be limited. So because of this limitation that microscopy gives you really rich data, but it's it's really constrained in terms of the, the number of channels, let's say, that you can look at at the same time, you do need, uh, I think it, it, there's a huge value in being able to do, to do data integration. So how would we maybe do that, right? So we can think about it as like a sort of atlas mapping problem. We have two unique measurements and we want to somehow overlay them and be able to ask questions about how they relate to each other, right? And of course, on a real atlas, this is easy because um, our, our, me our measurements, our individual unique measurements always come with a reference measurement, namely the location on the world map, right? And the, the world map locations are just straightforwardly mapped to each other. So, so this is not a problem, right? Um, it gets a tiny bit harder, but, but not necessarily if we have a sort of good, uh, a convenient case where our biological sample is relatively stereotypical. So this is a, an example of an organism called platinum race, which in the early stages is very, um, very stereotypical in its form. Actually, I think, so this is not a work I've done. This is, this is a really cool, from, from really cool work uh, of another group. And I actually think the first author here is in, in the audience, so hi. Um, um, so yeah, so, so here, since we have relatively stereotypical animal shapes, we can essentially use 
the overall shape of the animal as a reference measurement. Now, those aren't necessarily quite in the same reference frame as um, as in a world map, but with simple a sort of simple alignment um, uh, uh, registration. Uh, so spatial transformations are enough to bring everything into into the same um, into the same reference frame. Now, what about this case, right? This case becomes very complicated um, because these two tissues, although it's, they're both the lateral line, they're not stereotypical in any particular way, right? So how could we integrate the data here, right? And so the important thing to notice here is that on some level, on the extracted shape features of the cells, which I here used the same membrane marker for and extract the features in the same way, there is a correspondence. So these, these are different, they're not the same sample, but they're all sort of, they are cells within the same shape space of the same kind of tissue. So on the, in, when we move to structured data, we actually get a, a level of correspondence that is not immediately obvious when, when we're looking at unstructured data. And so we can do the same thing and move to, to uh, structured data for nuclear features and for, in this case, Golgi features. And now the problem essentially becomes relating the nuclear features to the, to the extracted chain features and relating Golgi features to the extracted chain features. And we can do that with machine learning. So we can learn you know, essentially to predict uh, interesting information about the nuclei from information about the cell shape. And then we can use cell shape information in images where we did not image the nuclei to um, predict those nuclear features and then make those comparisons. And of course, again, nowadays we're getting a new tool that maybe can uh, shortcut that sort of step to structured data and directly do this kind of prediction uh, exercise, prediction type of mapping uh, with using, using deep learning uh, in, the, in the unstructured image space. And by the way, the same principle, I'm not going to talk about this, this but the same principle allows us to map entire omics data sets where, shape, where, where spatial data is lost back onto imaging data. But here we use as reference me measurements that we are trying to map together uh, using, using machine learned models, we're using reference genes that we, that, that, we can, uh, that, that we can image with something like HDR in the, in the imaging case. And also, of course, have as part of the larger SCR and SEQ um, kind of data sets. And I think in the in the long run, the kind of cool thing that labs can build up is is a digital tissue, a kind of digital twin of the the, the tissues or the 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 the, the kinds of uh, kind of samples the systems that they care about. Where through various reference measurements, you can integrate all kinds of different information from cell shape, gene expression, temporal dynamics, uh, to more you know obscure measurements that are harder to take. But once you have them together with a reference, you can integrate them. Uh, back in like mechanical properties, for instance, and these digital tissues can serve as a kind of a basis for data mining, for, for constraining modeling, and then to sort of enrich them in a sort of virtuous cycle with follow-up experiments. Um, okay, so that's kind of the, the idea, uh, some, some, some broad strokes ideas on, on, on data integration. And for the last few minutes, I want to talk about data interpretation a little bit, in particular when it comes to these complex data sets. Right? And I, I would actually argue that interpretation is kind of the hard problem of, of biological uh, image analysis or biological data science in general. As soon as we're talking about these big data sets, these, these, these kind of complex, uh, complex data sets, so that might include also omics type of, of data sets and stuff like that. Because the, the fact is that systemic measurement alone, so doing high throughput, large scale, or integrated, multi-omic, whatever kind of uh, analysis of your system doesn't translate into a system's understanding by itself. And, and you know, big data does not give us good answers if I'll ask us asking good questions. At least that's sort of the conclusion I've come to uh, over the years of, of working in this space. I think it's a realization that is still uh, not, ha hasn't percolated everywhere, but, but it, you know, it, it's what I would argue. Um, and so what I think is we need ways of bridging biological questions or theories with big and rich data sets. Um, and that requires us to make the questions and the theories quantitative in, in and of themselves. Right? And the way we could do that is, is, is through modeling and simulation kind of approaches. So I'm going to give a very, very simple example coming back to this thing, this Drosophila situation here, where we have cells talking to each other with notch signaling um, in order to establish a, a sort of nice single line of responder genes uh, being active at the onset of, of, of Drosophila gastrulation. Uh, and this is from work. This is, uh, I think, among the few data sets that I have not acquired myself in, in this. This, is, this was done by Ranjit Vizvanathan uh, in, uh, in the Derensis, in Stefano Derensis' lab. And we collaborated on this. 
Um, so anyway, basically um, what they developed was an optogenetic tool with which you can activate notch signaling. And when they used that to just activate notch signaling everywhere in the embryo, it pretty quickly became clear that despite continuous activation, which initially activates uh, here the entire dorsal side, um, despite continuous activation, a lot of the cells stop responding. So cells get desensitized, they adapt, despite you know continuously having the notch intracellular domain in the nucleus. So if we, again, go through that process of segmenting and extracting um, our, our readout, we can kind of represent this overall as this kind of curve, despite in the input being continuous, the output uh, adapts and, and, and desensitizes. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's already kind of a, a big step done, but then we wanted to ask more questions of our data and here's where the sort of modeling and, and really the high level interpretation side comes in, right? One thing we wanted to ask is whether we can propose a regulatory motive that might underlie this kind of adaptation. And there's a few different motives that are known to be able to implement adaptation uh, adaptation behavior. I'm not gonna talk about that in detail. Uh, suffice to say that these can be relatively easily modeled using things like ordinary differential equations. And so what we ultimately did was to implement models for all of these three different types and apply them to um, to to our specific to, to to our data. And it turned out that all of them could fit the data a little bit. Um, none of them could fit it perfectly. And that was that was kind of unexpected to us. So so we sort of we sort of thought, okay, yeah, you know, we we so or, or putting it in in other words, right? We might have just hypothesized that it is negative feedback without thinking about it further. Um, and we would have, you know, may, maybe made a model, maybe done a couple of experiments, and it would have looked like it works out, and they would have proposed, uh, we would have proposed this result. But because we're doing things on the computational level, we could really test all of these different models and find that really these data are not sufficient to distinguish between these different models. And so there, that's where this feedback again came in that, that Elizabeth also mentioned, where we then went back to design other kinds of experiments and test them against different models. I'm not gonna gonna go into that. Uh, any further, it, it's published, you can read up on it, but, but suffice to say that in the end, based on the sort of cumulative, on that sort of feedback that goes all the way from the experiment through the image analysis to the model and back, um, we were ultimately able to propose that what is actually happening is state dependent on activation at the enhancer promoter complex. Uh, so yeah, again, what, what matters here is that the model-based thinking really helped us consider alternative hypotheses and, and then design and understand further experiments. And I think this is a very simple example, but we can we, we now are starting to have tools to get tools that are coming online that are, are, are should should give us the ability to really also work with big with complex data sets and and take this kind of approach. Uh, and I would encourage you to look, for instance, into simulation based inference. There's this is already old, I guess, because this field is moving very quickly, but it gives you an idea of how we can take that model based kind of perspective and and work with it in, in also really big data. Very briefly to conclude, the tools in the background, and maybe I'm going to be a little bit controversial here. The uncontroversial thing is the computational backbone of all of this work is numerical arrays, like almost regardless of which data, whether it's the unstructured or structured side, if you know how to work with numerical arrays, you can do almost anything. Um, I use Python for all of this, and, and the reason for that is because it's second best for everything. Um, so it's kind of the, the exact opposite of uh, on, you know, something like image J is perfect for image analysis, but, you know, Python is second best for image analysis, but Python is also second best for uh, statistics or for machine learning. Maybe it's probably the best for machine learning that's out there at the moment. Um, and second best for making a web app to share your data. And it's second best to for making something that automates things so that you can have an automated feedback to your microscope, which is something I didn't talk about today. So once you have this tool, you really have a generalist tool that you can use to sort of do almost anything. But I, I do want to note that on, on this sort of sort of way that my sort of stack of tools looks, Fiji is still in there because whenever I get the raw data in, I still want to sort of first look at it with just good old Fiji and maybe do a little bit of pre-processing, downsampling, et cetera, just with, with Fiji macros um, that, that, you know, as Elizabeth said, can easily deal with different uh, microscopy formats and, and the like. So um, it, it's really useful to get everything into a kind of format where then I can, it, it can be taken into Python and you can work from there. And, and the maybe controversial thing is that I, I've sort of, in, in doing this work, come to the conclusion that sophisticated tools require training and expertise to be used well. 
So it is just, I think, not true that you can make a user interface where people can click a button and get this, this sort of in-depth, uh, complex systems analysis, and, and and it all makes sense and it all works and it all works together and so forth. These these kinds of analyses, these kinds of tasks are difficult and and like that they're, they're sophisticated. They require you to use, uh, I think, the, and to be trained uh, on these sophisticated tools. As Progress as we make progress, of course, certain things can be simplified and they can be wrapped under a sort of interface where people can can click a, a, a button. But I think, for instance, um, 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 uh, the 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 colocalization analysis is a great example where if you publish a tool where you can do colocalization, it's almost certain that an, a lot of people will be uh, misusing it and misinterpret misinterpreting these results because it's not a simple thing. And and so when it comes to these uh, when it comes to these kinds of things, I, I will kind of argue that coding is superior to clicking uh, because you know in the process of learning to properly handle this, these kinds of computational tools at this level, you start you you learn what you need to know to not make uh, to not make huge mistakes or, or waste huge amounts of time um as you sort of try to model your way through an analysis and this is maybe specific for the kind of more sophisticated big data things for other things it, it can be different this is something a bit for the discussion but i thought that i put that out there um so yeah as i'm not going to go through the whole summary but um yeah i've talked about you know the quantification the integration and finally the interpretation of of new biological insights and uh, obviously, I should uh, I should thank uh, the Mayor Lab where I'm a postdoc now, and then many past and present collaborators on the on the right hand side and and Embo for funding. Um, that's me done. Thank you very much, Yunus, especially for the very fascinating and uh, nice images that you've shown. Um, and now uh, to our audience uh, or the speakers for sure, Elizabeth, if anyone would like to comment or say a question, feel free to. I, just, I think we've got our first question in the audience that if if you yeah. have a look at the chat. Uh, so uh, Asma is asking uh, whether image J can be used to take 3D pictures. Uh, if not, is there any 3D image analysis program recommended for C. elegans, which is a warm uh, research work? Um, so I can't speak too much to the image J side of things. Uh, maybe one very general point to make is that adding a dimension to your analysis is like makes things exponentially harder. So it, it, whatever you can do in 2D, you want to do in 2D. Whatever you can do in 3D, you want to do in 3D. When, whenever you add add dimensions, things, things get, get a lot harder. But yes, uh, I mean, uh, ImageJ can handle 3D pictures perfectly, perfectly well. Um, obviously, when it comes to sort of more sophisticated algorithms, and sort of programming things yourself, uh, then then again, it might be might be sensible to go to something like Python. I do know that there's a bunch of libraries that are specific for C elegant stuff, but I'm not familiar with them myself. I don't know if if Elizabeth knows more on that. Um, not really. No. Um. I think the question is also like taking 3D pictures. I think I would say ImageJ isn't meant to take 3D pictures, but just process data really. Yeah, but like, yeah. So if you, if you have three D pictures off of your microscope, then ImageJ is perfectly good for handling them. But yeah, so so and I think that the same step applies as for two D. Um, you know that there's a there's a lab, there's a step where a, a sort of a level a point where your analysis requires a level of sophistication where it starts to make sense to to move to other types of of backgrounds of backends like Python. But for basic analysis, uh, Fiji is very very good. So I have a uh, maybe maybe it's not a quick question, um, but thanks for that uh, that presentation. You got a lot of pretty images, which makes me feel very jealous. Um, you talked a lot about or well, towards the middle about machine learning, and my sort of very basic understanding of machine learning is it requires a lot of images to be fed in. So, can I ask how how many images are you typically using to sort of yeah. learn your machines and where are you sort of acquiring those images from? So that, that's a very, very good point. So there's a distinction here, I think, to be made between machine learning sort of in, in general and, and deep learning in particular. 
Um, so machine learning in general, that which which um, you might use, you might do on structured data, is much less data hungry. So these these are things like fitting multiple, you know, sort of multivariate, multivariable regression, essentially, like to not call it machine learning. Like it, it's these are simpler tools in some sense, and um, and and you know things like. Um, Things like log logistic regression, et cetera, or decision trees and so forth. They don't necessarily require huge amounts of data. So uh, the, the work that I do is, is with embryos, right? So you're very limited in terms of throughput. And so 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 we tend to talk about things on the scale of, of 20 to 100 embryos being in one of these data sets. So that you know gives something on the on the order of, of you know. 20, 40,000 cells being in a single cell segmentation data set, or, or maybe 100,000 cells on, on the upper end. Um, and and this, is, this is on the very low end to do deep learning. So I generally focus on first extracting structured data and then using non-deep type of machine learning uh, tools uh, to, to work on the structured data. And, and that, that works with that kind of data size. To go to deep learning, uh, you might need a lot more, but also there we are seeing constant improvements, right? So nowadays you might have, like you, you can be in situations, you, you, one, one trick that people do is to pre-train sort of generic image analysis, uh, like uh, deep net networks on like huge numbers of different images um, for things like segmentation, right? And then when you want to apply it to your specific case, all you need to do is fine tune that already sort of general, if you have a general model like Stardust, it can generally recognize things like nuclei or things like loosely convex shapes. Uh, and, and, it can, and, and it has been trained to do that across a huge range of modalities and, and different, different kinds of data. You come in now with your particular data set, you just need a little bit of training data to fine tune the algorithm to deal with your particular noise, your particular signal kind of thing. So, these kind of general pre-trained models are one way in which the deep learning stuff is also becoming accessible to, to, to the kind of data sizes that you can realistically get from embryos. So when you're, when you're talking about that sort of training as well, and you're talking about sort of um, when you have the noise signal, for example, are you, are you essentially, you've got your own data set and you're basically saying on each slide to the machine, this is what the signal noise is, Move, remove that for the next one so that when you actually plug in your proper images or your images that you're not training on the computer will be able to recognize that and go ahead with that is that um so, so it's kind of it, it depends a bit on application but like the general idea for most of the sophisticated tools is is, is supervised learning right so you have to have data that has both um, the input that you generally expect and the kind of thing that you that you want as an output. So you might have to do a bunch of manual segmentations to have the training segmentations. And you then basically just, you know, in, deep, in a deep learning context, you feed in your images and you feed in your segmentations uh, and, and it learns based on that, right? And then you can feed new images into it and it'll give you new segmentations. And that can, yeah, that, that sort of principle generally holds. And of course, you can do things like, if you want to do um, like a time course and you have to do relatively fast, gentle imaging, the quality might not be so good, right? But you can mm. take like a, you can take a data set of images where you're imaging the same thing with your time course setting, fast, gentle, low quality, and with a high quality setting as well. And those are then your, your training data, your, your, your input and your desired output. You train your algorithm and then you take your actual time courses with the, with the low quality setting and now your, your machine learning algorithm that has been trained might be able to give you to re, re, reconstruct high level images from those, those low level images. But with all of these things as well, I should say, like you have to do science with them, right? So uh, you have to do things like cross validation. So you don't give all of your, of your training data in, 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 in for, for the training and then you just assume it's fine, right? You keep some back where you know the true result and you check that how well does my algorithm do? what kinds of failure cases are there that, that you might have to explicitly deal with. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something again that, that does require a level of technical expertise where, where it's a, it can be a little bit risky if people, like now that we're starting to get to points where you can kind of go on like a Google Colab notebook for Stardust or something, you press some buttons and it does the segmentation for you. Um, you really have to evaluate your results because there, there is a good chance that, uh, that, that there might be some, some really unexpected problems in there as well that as a, if, if you're not, if you don't have the expertise for it, it, it can be a little bit dangerous.
yeah. Well, yeah, lots to think about. That's a really cool way, I think, of looking at low quality and comparing it to the high quality sort of images. Um, I also have a question. Maybe it's not really related to Fiji, but to other software. Um, so because both of you, like Elizabeth and Eunice, you mentioned segmentation uh, multiple times. Um, to my knowledge, um, and that's what I actually use, I use something like Spina or uh, Elastic for such segmentations and stuff. Would you generally recommend those uh, kinds of software? Because both are also open source. You can get them for free. Um, I guess I'll go first. I haven't, I haven't heard of Spina, but I have about Elastic, I, I know fairly well. Um, I, I don't know if I generally recommend. I mean, I think there are many problems that these kinds of software can solve well, and, and so it can be, can be very useful. Um, again, like I think they're not, you know, they're not silver bullets necessarily, and you, and and obviously you need to do careful evaluation of of the results. Um, I, I guess I personally tend to prefer to go to a sort of code based environment rather than something like like Elastic, because it means that you know, in terms of reproducibility, for instance, everything I do is there in the code. There was no, there is no step where I click things and I sort of describe in the method section of the paper which settings I clicked or didn't click maybe. Um, or we use the default settings that on a further, on a, on a future version, they will have changed and people install the, the elastic software that defaults may not be the same as they were whenever you did your paper, right? So, so that's where kind of reproducibility also in my mind argues a little bit for, for using, for, for moving towards code based interfaces. But in principle, I mean, especially segmentation to my mind, you know, it's becoming a bit of a, of an upstream problem. Like, you know, for, for a long time, image analysis was all about segmentation and it's still a very important problem, but we're getting towards the point where more generic solutions like Elastic and like Stardist and, and deep learning kind of things are pretty good at dealing with most kind of problems. So that's why sort of my focus is starting to be on what we do with the segmented data rather than segmentation, segmentation per se, I will say. I think just to add to that as well, I think it really depends on your question, right? Um, for example, if you just want to count the number of nuclei and Elastic does the job, use it, right? Why overcomplicate it? Um, and I think, yeah, I agree with Jonas, the more complicated things get, the more I also tend to go into like the coding kind of world, because it's definitely, you can control what's happening and you know why things go wrong if they go wrong. And I I think that is one big thing with, for example, Elastic, that people are sat onto the computer and they're not properly trained, but they get like a sheet of like click A, B and C, and then they expect something to happen. Right. And I think that is a huge problem for reproducibility. And like Jonah said, then they write in the paper, we used Elastic to count cells and no one knows what they actually did. Right. And I think for things like that, macros or code is amazing because you can share it and people can just run the same thing on their computer and understand why isn't it working on their data or why what do they need to improve with with the things that they're trying to look at and I think for a producibility definitely um I would also go for like code-based approaches or at least kind of have a screen film of something you know of what you actually do and share that with people yeah. Can I ask as well on that front with the reproducibility and you're saying people are sharing macros and, and they're coding that they're using to automate this sort of stuff. Um, when you're looking at people's papers as well, possibly there should be some uh, sort of how they've actually acquired the images, what sort of settings they're using on their microscope, because I tend to find that people don't typically include that or journals don't include that. So that also help in terms of um, whether we're not using Python or Fiji, making sure that your data is comparable to someone else's data and sort of standardizing the, the field. I mean, the more information, the better, right? Like, um, um, and, and I, I would say, I mean, the thing is, yeah, I, <laughs> Elizabeth has said it, garbage in, garbage out, right? So if at the microscope, you're not doing the thing that, the, that, that was done by the, pub, by the people who published the paper, you don't get the same results. It's it's not reproducible, right? But but I, I you know so there is a I've been thinking about this a bit. Right? I, I learned recently that like a hundred years ago, 
uh, the onus of reproducibility was much more on the reproducer rather than on the people publishing results. So the assumption was generally that the published result was correct. And if you can't reproduce it, it's because you don't do it right. Um, mm -hmm. So that was like a hundred years ago, right? And, and there was a lot of sort of experimental skill, which is still the case for a lot of experiments. There was a lot of, you know, fine experimental skill in how to exactly do the staining and dissections and stuff like that. Um, and I think there's like, there's a balance here, right? Like on the one hand, I think it's good to to emphasize that, you know, we, we should we should communicate as much information about how we did the experiment as possible, including micros microscope setups, right? I think in an ideal world, we would have tools for that, where you can literally, you know, export, share your settings in a sort of interpretable way so that other people can readily reproduce or even reload your settings, right? If you share all data, that might be possible anyway. Um, but there is expertise as well that that isn't it just is inefficient to put that on paper it, it will it, it will never happen right it's the stuff that you learn like oh it's so hard to mount these fish in a way that my images get good well there's there's no magic to it you just need to do it 10000 times and then your images are perfect every time it's perfectly re reproducible for someone who knows how to do it right so so on on some hand at least that's where i'm sort of moving to these days we need to kind of counterbalance a bit and say reproducibility does not mean that it has to work out of the box it just means that with a reasonable effort an expert can reproduce it, it that that's sort of where i would come down on that but but happy to hear the comments of people no i i think that makes a lot of sense um you know because there's always different conditions in every single lab it seems and and people working in the same lab might not necessarily be able to do it immediately so i think your your reasoning there is is probably well valid yeah yeah i myself cannot even um, mention how many times i try to replicate something that has been published and actually very well cited and i never get the same result ever and then I end up having to modify such protocol in some way to get what I need to get. Um, I have had a recent experience publishing in, uh, in Nature, so Springer in general, Springer Nature, and uh, they have been trying to reinforce some reproducibility uh, guidelines and they try to ask the authors to submit every single detail they know of like the macros how the, the images were edited even if they adjusted the brightness etc so it's it's good but at the same time i agree with Jonas that there is the know-how of things and it's not usually even published and um, sometimes people keep it to themselves and sometimes it's just the experience. It's just something you get with time. Even if you try to help the person, even if you have the person next to you, front of the computer and try, try to explain it to them, they will still not be able to reproduce everything you, you've just done. So, yeah. And I think also to add to that, the important thing is that when you're in a lab, there's a lot of things of like the negative results and the things that we don't do that we we know but we don't really write up or we tell someone and that's the things that have often the biggest difference right like don't shake this solution or don't cool it or whatnot right and that's the magic, and magic. Trick that we never <laughs> yeah that we never mentioned yeah true that's true yeah having some negative publishing would probably be a way of going forward like that maybe like accompanying papers about what not to do when you're doing your protocol papers yeah i mean may maybe but there is a there is a, a sense in which the, the ways in which you can go wrong are huge right like there's just a huge space of possible ways to, to go wrong and you might not be aware uh, even as you know you, you might have no idea that someone else might might make a mistake if you're the person publishing how to do it right so so there's a there's a vast space of how not to do things and, and it, I think it can be kind of difficult to like yeah I, I'm sometimes not so sure how much value we really gain from pointing out one way of of, of not do of, of not doing it right unless that's that's an obvious way right unless that's the way that people would start with if they didn't know better right then a negative result can be hugely important right but very often it, it's 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 a drop in a, in a in a bucket of a gigantic space of possible failures so uh, yeah i think this is kind of a it's, it's a difficult it's a more 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 difficult question i think it's very easy nowadays of course or 
since since ever, right? People are saying we should have more negative results. We should have more accompanying things on how not to do stuff, etc. And it's kind of hard to get researchers to do it, but maybe there is a principled argument for saying that um, not all negative results are created equal, right? And, and like there's there's a lot of them that sort of fall into a vast space of you know things that that yeah of of lots of things that can go wrong, right? So yeah. Uh, no, what 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 your thoughts are on that? Presumably, you're more on the on the pro negative results side. Let's say. Yeah, I I think so, and and those are very very good points. So you can't really take into account every bit everything that's going to be negative, um, but you know, seeing a little bit more, especially with um, image acquisition and data analysis, I think being more open about that is really gonna help other people as well um i also want to ask as well and this is probably for both using because we're talking about macros and also the coding element of things so um you know automation and reproducibility and all that sort of stuff so um to both elizabeth and jonas then typically when i'm performing my experiments i'm quite worried that what i'm asking the computer to do or the computer is not going to understand what I want the computer to do. And so I'm going to get a difference between what I want and what the computer is actually going to give me. And I was just thinking about this as specifically as well in terms of um, some of your slides that you had on there, Jonas, with the collective cell migration, where typically, you know, you might have leader cells, which are more mesenchymal like, and then like a degree of epithelialness behind. Uh, in terms of like labeling those cells and saying, okay, or, or to a computer and saying, these ones at the front, of this specific cell type, these ones at the back of this specific cell type, but everything in the middle, which is more of like a gradual change and that you don't have a discrete difference between the two. How are you then going about actually saying, this is what this particular cell is that looks slightly more epithelial than mesenchymal-like or vice versa? How would you go about doing that? And I think, you know, whether, and whether or not that's even possible to do on uh, Fiji as well would be a great insight as well. Um, I guess I can say something from because I've I've, I've dealt with this exact thing. So, so it is it is in in, in the paper, um, and and actually the way I did that was with a mix of Fiji and Python at the end of the day. So I, I can maybe show a uh, whole up if I can share like and just go back to a bit that I skipped. Let's see here. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so basically, um, I, I, I called this here context labeling and or, or, or context mapping. So the idea is here you have you have your, your lateral and primordium and you have your leader cells in the front and then you have different, in this case, different types of follower cells that are distinguished. So the, the trick that I kind of used here was to use Fiji to, to go in and manually label uh, label label some of these cells as leader cells or as, as, as particular follower cells. Um, and what I did was labeling what I call the archetypes. So these are the cells that are really clear representations of, um, of, of the biological sort of cell type or, 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 or cell states that, that I'm looking for. And I only labeled those and then extracted the, the labels from Fiji back into Python. And I used these to again, train a classifier algorithm, so a machine learning algorithm that looks at the cell shape and it learns to predict um, the probability with which each cell belongs to each archetype. And so for the intermediate ones, you, you end up getting probabilities like 50-50 or 30-70. Or and you can kind of, this is probably very small here, but you can kind of represent this in a space where at the corners are the archetypes and all the cells in between um, represent uh, represent uh, sort of mixtures of these types. So, so there's basically there's, uh, in other words, like from a tooling perspective, here since you have interactivity, you would want to go to Napari or Fiji, since it's up to you to add your knowledge into the, into the computer in some way, and then you can again go to these more sophisticated tools like machine learning to, for instance, interpolate between the cornerstones of of, of your knowledge. I don't know. Yeah, I should write something up about this because I think it's 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 it could be very broadly useful, um, but it's sort of nobody talks about this. It's it's great that you asked the question. 
I think it's also really important to add that it's about the probabilities, right? It's not like mm. the black and white answer, but actually probability of like the, you know, yeah, kind of where does it fall into this scope? And I think that's why the machine learning is so great that you get probabilities rather than solid answers. Um, so yeah, Jonas writes, we all want to know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that, that obviously depends again on, on, the, on the approach, on the machine learning approach. But yeah, there are ways of basically getting getting those those probabilities, and that's that can be very useful for for these cases. And then you can, you know, you can ask questions like, uh, you know, if if you just classify everything into groups, right? You can obviously ask statistics questions of like, oh, is this higher in this group or is it lower in the other group? But sometimes you get, you know, you get a very small difference. But if you can instead ask for the correlation between like a continuum between these two groups, you might see that like it's actually it's actually pretty clear the pattern is actually pretty clear so you get actually higher sensitivity for resolving like what is relevant to to answering a biological question so this this can be quite valuable i think yeah yeah absolutely agree with you there i typically have that where you know you well that's a great way of overcoming it in terms of where you have the data sets you have you've classified these two cell types manually but then everything in the middle sort of makes the statistics you know non-significant almost and then you know you, that's when you introduce bias as well i think if you're looking at images and trying to go okay that's this cell but is it definitely that cell or are you hoping it's that cell right and that's going in the answer yeah i also have uh, one point to uh, to pose actually so um i am working sometimes with electron microscopy and that also produces very complicated and dirty data. And sometimes it it's really depending on how you're segmenting whatever you're interested in. And that can make a whole lot of difference at the end. Um, so usually when we submit papers that have uh, some electron microscopy uh, analysis and macros and stuff, sometimes you get the question from the reviewer, why did you choose? this particular way to analyze your images. And the problem is, in many cases, the answer is because the PI in my lab does it like that. I don't know why. I have never gone through the comparison, so I don't know. So if you are in such situation, what would you recommend? Like even before submitting the paper, how should people um, rationalize their selection of the model or the macro or the plugin they're using. Jaren, <laughs> no, I think I think it's like it's such a good question because like I think a lot of the times that is what we see with a lot of techniques, right? It's not just image analysis, but a lot of techniques where people are like using what the supervisor wants to use or where the license is there or whatnot, right? And I think. It is obviously very difficult if you are in a lab where there is clearly a hierarchy and you feel like you can't address this with supervisors. But I think the earlier you can talk about comparing different methods or maybe trying something that is not always used in a lab, but maybe has a slightly different approach is really valuable because even if you use something new and it fails, you learn something from it. And I think especially when you're like a master's student or a PhD student, this is what you're there to do, right? You're there to learn. And so you shouldn't use something or do something just because you're told to. You should think about why is it that I use this specific staining or this specific approach and what do I want to achieve with it? So I think, yeah, I think especially like if you're in like a learner position, you should always kind of question very, very um, clearly why am I using it, right? If you're paid as a technician to do certain thing, it's obviously more difficult because it's literally kind of your job description to do what the PI kind of asks you to do, right? But if you're there to learn, then I think you're more in like, yeah, you should question it probably a little bit more, if that makes sense. I mean, yeah, I, I really like that perspective, the the learning side of things. And I, I mean, I would also add to that, right? Like how, how did I, how did I get to the point where I use all these techniques and like, how do I know that the way I program some, take some approach is like the right way or, or whatever, right? Like all of that came from lots of experimentation and lots of learning, just, just trying things and not sort of shying away from that, right? But there's also a point where, you know, I mean, 
if you have something that works and you have controls, like, you know, you've done the science, you've got controls, it works, it makes sense. Um, at that point, the reviewer's argument, in my opinion, of like, oh, why didn't you try this other tool that might also work is not is without merit, right? And, and, and at some point, you kind of say as much, right? Like, uh, at some point, I would say, yeah, I mean, that's we use this, it works. Is there any concern that it might not work, right? I, th I think there is no obligation necessarily to just try out every method that might work just so you may you find the one that works one percent better than than the others right all of them for work 90 percent and you're looking for the 91 percent I, I would add that or like that that brings me to kind of general insight actually on, on image analysis segmentation is a very good example of this how do you get the perfect segmentation how do you know you're done optimizing your segmentation, right? And never initially, you, <laughs> it's, they're never perfect. And you could almost, always maybe get better if you add another pre-processing step or train yeah. a bit like on a bit more data or whatever. In my PhD, I spent ages like trying to get better segmentations. But a segmentation like is, it needs to be as good as you need it to be to answer your biological questions. That is that like to me, that is the lesson learned. Like you don't need arbitrarily good segmentations. You need good enough segmentations. And that means you need to know what question you're asking, right? You can't like, that is an important uh, step there because then you, you, you might have an idea of how good your, your, your segmentation actually needs to be. It's be always better to be better, but at some point, if your p-value in the in the comparison you care about at the end, you know, goes from zero point zero 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 one to adding another zero, you know, you've done a lot of work for very little scientific gain, right? Yeah. So yeah, making things good enough, I think, is a is a pretty is a pretty smart approach when it comes to choosing algorithms and stuff like that. Yeah, I agree definitely. I I like that philosophy. I'm definitely after implement that when I'm having discussions with my supervisor. I think a lot of us are perfectionists as well. So having that sort of limit is a good way of, of mitigating. Yeah. And and I, I would add maybe because I've been I've been sort of hammering a bit on the like, oh, you know, you should you should you should code and you should do things properly and reproducibly and so forth. But of course people have different levels of expertise. And I think the good enough standard should also to some extent apply there. Like it should not be an exclusionary thing where you have to have 10 years of experience in order to publish a paper that has some computational aspect to it, right? Like but the part that is computational that do that 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 you do as maybe a non-expert, it has to be good enough so you have to have some checks and balances in there you might want to have an expert look over it right but at some point you don't like I, yeah I, I think there is a kind of like there, there is a there is a, a possibility that the emphasis on you know really having perfectly clean code and everything documented and perfectly reusable and so forth becomes an exclusionary thing where most people who have you know, some basic or even decent coding knowledge, it's not on that on that research software engineering level, right? And I think that is another balance that the community, I think, is still kind of trying to find and like what is what is good enough in different contexts. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's also a huge question of the field, right? If you look at medical image analysis, it's a very, very different approach. Obviously, if you work with patient data, especially like, you know, questions of brain cancer or things like that it is a very different kind of level that you you need to kind of test and and look at and stuff um but yeah I agree with Jonas absolutely that I think the field has a lot of discussions at the moment of what is good enough in terms of documentation and code and sharing and and kind of finding this balance and I think yeah, we need those discussions, like today, for example, saying what, what each one of us thinks about it, because I think there's no right or wrong, right, mm -hmm. to all of this. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah. Uh, all right, if we don't have any further questions from the audience, it seems like, then I'd like to deeply thank Elizabeth and Jonas for their contribution today. And uh, I'd also like to thank our team for organizing today's webinar and uh, to the attendees and those who might be watching the recording later. Uh, we hope you learn maybe something new today that could potentially help you with your uh, data analysis journey. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, for making today's meeting possible. And uh, we hope to see you soon, uh, anytime in the future.
Thank you so much. Cool, I think that's just us in there now. So thank you both for those, those talks. Those were both absolutely fantastic. Um, really insightful, I think. And um, a lot of people I think are gonna be really interested to see the sort of outcome of what we've, we've discussed today. Um, I'm not entirely sure when this is gonna go up on, on the BioProtocols website, but when it does, I'll get in touch, send a link, you know, keep on sharing, getting the information out there. Lots of important um, uh, conversations, I think, that we've had there. Yeah, I think especially because, like, at the moment is also the FMC in the UK. And today on Twitter, there were loads of discussions about, like, data understanding, data quality, you know, things like that. So I think it was very kind of timely with, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so very good um, fit with that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, sorry, go on, join us. No, no, just just uh, just agreeing, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was it was great having you both uh, uh, come on and speak for us. So thank you so much for that. Um, and um, I'd like to ask if it's okay if I can contact um, both of you later because you have also inspired me today to do something a bit different with my data. Some of my data I have in mind. Uh, but there are still a couple of things I cannot really figure out so far. So maybe I would need your expertise to tell me what to do, because now my PI is like, eh, do whatever you want. So yeah. if I have the decision, <laughs> then I can have fun. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I think Jonas and I, we always love talking about everything like data stuff so yeah yeah for sure for sure for sure uh, you know part of part of becoming an expert i think is is learning and part of it yeah. is like helping others and thinking about it right like so absolutely yeah feel free to reach out thank you thank you so much love that mentality okay awesome well um yeah i don't want to keep you too long because obviously it's the evening time for you guys as well but um yeah i'll, I'll keep you updated and let you know how how things are going cool that's cool. great thank you so much for having us again thanks thank you, yeah no absolutely problem. and i'm uh, so happy to have you here and yeah take care take and care see you around see you see you later bye-bye <laughs>